Hey, what's up? If you love attacking and playing aggressive openings, then you're gonna love the today's video. There is a very interesting opening version called the Blackmore Demer Gambit, where white starts off seemingly classical way, but after that, all of a sudden, sacrifice their pawn on e4 and follow up with knight c3 and then followed up with pawn to f3. Again, it's a very interesting opening for white. Many beginner to intermediate level players find it very attractive. And in fact, the video about this gambit is one of the most popular videos on this channel. But not many players know that you can in fact use the very same aggressive approach against various different openings, not just for this queen's gambit, or so to say. Okay, so today we're gonna see how you can use the very similar, if not the same, setup against the Karakan defense. And I also plan recording another video where I'm gonna share with you how to use it basically universally across anything that your opponent can possibly play. So do subscribe to not miss out on the continuation. And today let's dive into the Karakan defense, which starts off with white playing pawn e4 and black was pawning pawn to c6, preparing this pawn d5 advancement. And after that, we're going d4, d5. So far, everything is standard. We're going knight c3. And this trivial move in this particular case is somewhat deceptive because your opponent thinks that after they take, you're going to recapture. And this just leads to the main line of the Karakan. But in reality, after they capture, you're gonna play pawn f3, offering this gambit pawn. And you can easily notice the similarity of this position compared to the Black Mardimer gambit. It's pretty much the same. Black just played this pawn to c6 compared to, you know, the Black Mardimer where they had their knight on f6. And in fact, probably having the knight is even would be better for Black. So in this case, you're kind of getting a slightly improved version in a way of the Black Mardimer gambit. And this is very likely to catch your opponent off guard. They're probably unaware of this gambit and they don't really know how to play. Now, black, if they try refuting your gambit, so to say, must accept this pawn sacrifice. If not, well, guess what? You're gonna take yourself and build up the strong center and everything's cool. If black tries to just give up the pawn here on e3 for no reason, you're gonna grab it and you know you control the center, you are leading in development, everything's cool. So that's definitely not the way for black to possibly refute your setup. The only principled move is pawn takes f3, which will actually get us to this position. And before we dive into the variations, let me also tell you a couple general patterns about this opening so that even if you happen to forget some of the variations that I'm about to share with you, which you know is, is a normal case, you still know how to play, right? Because your plan is actually very, very simple. Develop quickly, attack, and celebrate your victory, right? So that's it, the three-step plan, okay? And basically, even if your opponent plays certain move that we didn't analyze today, or you just forgot what we analyzed, your approach is very, sim is very simple. You bring your pieces out, perhaps you castle, sometimes kingside, sometimes queenside, you de develop your pieces very quickly, and because you have a lot of open lines and diagonals, it's very easy for you to start attacking. Also, thanks to your huge leading development, you're always ahead, and therefore it's easier for you to begin your attack. And in many variations, there are so many pitfalls that your opponent can easily get into and you win right away. But even if that's not the case, you're still having a long-term initiative, which is an enough compensation for a pawn. Especially for Blitz, I definitely take white any day of the week because it's just easier to attack than to find precise defensive moves for black. Anyway, now let's talk about this a little more specifically. Usually your opponents will play knight f6 as the most played move, and then you play bishop c4, which simply develops your bishop, but also sets a nice little trap along the way. Lots and lots of your opponents will play this move bishop g4, because it looks so tempting for black to pin this knight, bring the bishop out before they lock the pawn chain, and it, it really is a good positional move. But the only problem is that it fails tacti tactically to bishop takes f7. It's not even a sacrifice because on the next move after king takes a knight to e5 check, you're gonna get the bishop back thanks to this fork. So it's fork, it's double attack to the king and the bishop, you're gonna get the bishop back. Now after that, black goes probably king g8 or king e8, doesn't really matter. Now you take the bishop back. And after that, what happens here in this line is that we have this king which is permanently weak. In fact, you're threatening checkmate in one. <laughs> which is nice. But even if black, you know, saves their king right now, still they're in a big trouble because this king is just that weak and there is nothing black can do about that. You can easily castle and bring your rook to the f file, which will support your attack, your bishop can get out, you know, it, your attack is just so natural that you're completely winning here. 
All right, let's go over another common line. So here, black still captures on f3, we recapture, so we're developing the knight simultaneously, and we just discuss the move knight f6. But in addition to that, black often develops their bishop on g4 right away. And in this case, there is no tactics here, because your bishop is not yet on c4, so we can't capture there, but you can just play the move pawn h3. And this raises the evergreen Shakespeare's question to take or not to take. And as you can easily see, one of these moves is losing the game right away. Of course, I'm kidding, <laughs> there's no way to see it, which is great, because many of your opponents will fall right into this trap. It's completely obvious that, you know, one of these moves is losing the game. And in fact, the, the, the very standard reaction of black, when, as soon as you play pawn h3, is to drop the bishop back to h5, right? right? That's how usually black does it in various different openings. But in this case, strangely enough, bishop h5 really loses the game. Man, this is crazy. So you're, you're just keep pushing here, g4, pawn h4. By the way, another general note about all this stuff. You're not afraid of pushing these pawns forward and using them to attack because you always reserve the option to castle queenside. And in fact, castling queenside is very common in these positions, which again, resemble the black mardim or gambit. So, I mean, it, it, it's really cool. It just gives you additional attacking opportunities and you can easily bring your bishop out in the future, bring your queen to e2 and castle queenside, you know. This is just a general note. So, I mean, we're not afraid to push these pawns. Now, an immediate threat is pawn h5, which will capture the bishop. Therefore, in order to stop that, black would need to move their own pawn, either to h5 or to h6, but it doesn't change anything because your following moves are going to be the same. h6 is the most popular move, and then you play knight to e5, which hits this bishop, and it's not just an exchange, because after that we're going to disrupt the pawn structure, and, for example, I mean, normally black will drop their bishop back, but let me just show you what's going to happen if they don't. If they don't, you're going to capture it here, and as you can see, it opens the door to the king's residence. And after that, you can play, let's say, bishop d3, and it's actually a threat of checkmate in one, and it's not that easy for black to stop it at all, right? So for that reason, black really needs to re react here. They can't just let you take it. That would be really sad. Now, they bring the bishop back. So far, looks like everything's good for black, but you play bishop c4, still hitting this pawn twice, still threatening bishop takes f7 checkmate in one. <laughs> Again, pretty cool. Black plays e6 to blockade it, and then you play queen e2, which sets it up for the little combo knight takes f7 on the next move, followed by queen takes e6 checkmate. And again, strangely enough, it's really hard for black to stop it, nearly impossible, even if your opponent notices the threat, because you're gonna play it after almost any move of black. And even if black somehow manages to defend the pawn, I don't know, queen c7 or something like that, you can always bring your rook here and just hit this pawn once again, and there is no way for black to defend it anyway, and therefore black will collapse. But in most cases, they don't play queen c7, they develop their knight, one of the knights, let's say knight f6, and then you can execute your main threat, knight takes f7. So, so far it's double attack, black is forced to take, but then queen takes e6, check. The only square for the king to go to would be king to g6, which gives you a nice opportunity to play pawn h5 and deliver a checkmate that way. It's always satisfying when you can deliver a check made by your pawn, and in this variation you have very realistic chances to do just that. Alright, let's explore some other ways to humiliate your opponents. <laughs> Alright, so still your opponent goes bishop g4, you play pawn h3, and as we already know, bishop h5, strangely enough, loses the game because you start pushing pawns on the king side very aggressively, and black's position falls apart. A better alternative for black would be to trade here on f3, and then you recapture. It's also nice because you develop your queen, black is still completely passive, and, you know, together with the bishop, this queen can possibly deliver some sort of scholar's checkmate, you know. And in addition to that, by developing your queen, you're also preparing castling queenside. And again, in many variations of uh, this opening, you are going to castle queenside, because, you know, here you already moved some pawns, your queenside is slightly weak, and therefore you're often uh, in castle queenside. After queen takes f3, your opponent can definitely take this pawn. If your opponent doesn't take, again, it's all the same. You're gonna develop your pieces, perhaps you're gonna develop the pawn, castle, queen side, in the middle game you can develop bishop c4, hitting it here, and you start pushing the pawns. So again, even if black saves their position from immediate disaster, you're having this long-term pressure, and it's just easier to play for white. You just, again, remember, develop quickly, attack, and celebrate, right? If your plans were simple for black, it's much harder to figure out what to do. So let's 
take here on d4. In the classical black mar demar gambit, this move queen takes d4 is actually a correct response for black in a similar position. But here it doesn't really work, because you play bishop e3, hitting the queen, getting one more tempo for development. And I've just checked in the database that in majority of the cases your opponent is going to play queen f6, trying to get away with two extra pawns and to get a winning endgame. But of course, we're not going to be that generous. So instead of that, we're going to play queen g3, saving queens, because we want to keep attacking in the middle game. Also, from g3, your queen is ready to sneak here to c7, potentially, and create a lot of devastation there. Usually, black goes pawn e6, then we castle queen side, and again, believe it or not, black is already lost. It's just hopeless. Whatever they do, you're going to win. For example, bishop b4, like one of the popular moves here fails to that move queen c7 which we already discussed threatens queen c7 queen c8 check with the with checkmate on the next move or queen b7 capturing the rook uh, the bishop the knight everything <laughs> literally there and black is defenseless so bishop b4 does not work for black if black tries knight to d7 looks better at first i mean queen c7 is still strong i guess it's still winning here but you've got even a stronger option which is knight to b5 another also cool tactics. Actually, it's a common tactical pattern again for these different variations. Current threat is knight to c7 fork and check to the king. If black takes and they have to ca capture them, bishop takes b5, you're developing a bishop with a tempo and you're hitting this knight. And basically there is nothing for black to do. Rook d8 is the only move to defend the knight temporarily, but then you can even kind of trade here on d7 and go inside with queen b8 check and you're getting to the king and this is all over. Notice that the rook is pinned and can't move. If king goes here, there is bishop c5, nearly checkmate. It's gonna be checkmate on the next move actually. So that's not an option. Queen d8 may seem like it saves black, but it's not because you trade here and you follow up with rook d1. And again, you know, like rook d1 is not the only winning move, I guess. I mean, probably queen b7 would also win. So even if you forget some of the specific moves here in the position, still you just bring your pieces out and you start attacking opponent's king. It's very simple. Even if you forget specific moves, you just do that. And yeah, that's it. And again, you should always remember that your opponents probably know very little to nothing about this opening operation at all. So even if you know just a little bit, you're still way ahead. And at this point, I do hope that somebody will go in comments and write that it's all complete nonsense because black doesn't have to fall into any traps and black can just play some completely obvious moves such as pawn e6 and black is a pawn up and this whole black bar demur gambit and the she bank and the complete nonsense, okay? And I hope that somebody will do that because I've already prepared my answer to just that. So if black plays in a very stubborn way, Let's say they go knight f6, but after you play bishop c4, black indeed doesn't go into any bishop g4 stuff, but just plays pawn f6 and says, hey, I'm a pawn up, you've got nothing. In this case, indeed, you have no tricks to win the game immediately, and black is indeed a pawn up. But you still are ahead in development, you're still having a lot of open lines and diagonals. For example, after a castle, your rook automatically is on the semi-open file, which is going to support your middle game attack. And let's say black keeps playing in a very solid way, bishop e7. So your plan is still, remember, develop quickly, attack and celebrate, right? We're gonna attack the king. For that reason, there is another common maneuver, which is worth remembering. It's queen goes to e1, as from there, it's ready to jump either to g3 or to h4 and to point out to black's castling. So after black castles, your queen is always ready to jump somewhere there. You can also relocate your bishop back to d3 so that it also starts pointing towards the king because again your plan is to concentrate all of the, your pieces against the opponent's king so bishop d3 follows this purpose black goes knight d7 or whatever and you play queen h4 and now already you can see that your attack starts you know creating certain specific threats it's not a threat yet but overall black's position is is pretty hard already actually and your plan right now would be to just eliminate the defender of this h7 square and then queen h7 would be checkmate. How can you eliminate this defender, this knight? Well, pretty easy, right? You're gonna go bishop g5, let's say, not that way, bishop g5. You can also bring your knight to e5, which would open up the f file for the rook. And again, I think that in a real game, it's extremely difficult for black to do anything about this. They never really wanna play pawn h6, because in this case, you'll happily sacrifice your bishop right there, open up the king and now it's completely bad you're gonna go something like knight g5 bishop h7 and uh, win the game so that's never the solution for black let's take it back 
Black tries pawn g6 to block this diagonal. In this case, the black weakens uh, the dark squares. And you can take advantage of that. Now, bishop g5 can completely paralyze black, but can't move their knight away. And you still want to play knight e5 and, you know, put more pressure here. A common move for black is rook e8, defending this bishop so that at least the knight can move without losing this bishop, standing behind the knight. And then you can still play knight e5, very common move again, bringing your rook into the attack as well as your knight, of course. And after an exchange here, pawn takes, knight goes somewhere. And in this position, you've got this common sacrifice, rook takes f7 to completely destroy black's castle. And after that, you follow up with queen to h7, king f8. And here, either rook f1 or bishop g6 or bishop h6. I mean, you've got a huge choice of winning options. Bishop h6, for example, is the checkmate in one. But I mean, overall, your attack is so strong that you have just really a lot here. And now's the time to brush up your tactical vision. It's our puzzle of the day. The black player is Capablanca and it's black to play and win. If you can't find the winning shot, please write it down in the comments below. Let's see if you can get it. Now you may wish to check out this video about the Black Mar Demar Gambit because again these two openings are very similar. Also don't forget to sign up and hit the bell so that you don't miss out on the follow-up which I'm about to release very soon covering how you can use the very same attacking plan for white not only against the Karakhan but against virtually any moves of black so that you can get this universal opening for white. Keep crushing it, bye!